What makes a good upper mid watch? What do you need to be aware of and where do you still get value if there is such a thing? I've said it before and I'll say it again. Below $4,500-ish dollars, you get a ton of value. Each dollar that goes into building a watch translates into a better watch for the price. Less money, relatively speaking, goes to establishing the brand. And as a result, the price doesn't get pumped up nearly as much as in the high end. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't consider a six or eight or 10 or 12 or $15,000 watch. Let's dive in. The range we're going to talk about today is the range where the most popular watches, the flagship models of a given brand, cost somewhere between four and $14,000. That's about a 10K range, which covers Tudor at the low end, all the way up to Glashütte and potentially Blancpain in the high end. It's Hublot and Tag Heuer. It's Rolex and Gégé Le Coultre. It's Cartier. These are some of the heaviest hitters in the mass production watchmaker market. These are the brands on the main floor of Watches and Wonders. They are the household names. Some of them have watches that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, but their bread and butter is upper middle class customers with money to spend on a single status watch. They sell you the I have arrived watch or the I got married watch or I just had a son or a daughter watch. This is a big outlay for most people. So apart from the house and the car, this is likely going to be one of the single most expensive purchases these customers will ever make. What do customers expect? Identity. I have to start off with a sweeping statement. Most regular customers that buy a watch in this space do not have a clue. Before you freak out, remember, if you see yourself as a regular customer, I'm going to tell you, you're not. You're watching this video. You actively went to YouTube to learn something about watches. That is not a regular upper mid-range customer. Also, I don't expect a regular customer to have a clue. A long, long time ago, I used to work in IT sales. I sold PCs and CPUs and printers and most people just don't care enough to understand what everything actually means. They would look at a Hubel Packard and say, oh, it sounds reputable, I've heard the name, so it's probably a good printer. They might have heard the name Epson, it was Japanese, they probably make good printers. They might even have heard of Compaq, which don't exist anymore, and they would have thought, sounds like a reputable brand, must be good enough. The things we as enthusiasts care about are totally uninteresting to the mainstream buyer. The stereotypical upper mid-range customer will ask questions like the ones I'm going to say now when they meet a watch enthusiast. How many watches do you have? How many Rolexes do you have? Can you get me a Rolex? Is it hard to get a Rolex? Is Omega as good as Rolex? If it's a woman, the brand Cartier will eventually come up, but otherwise it's largely the same. If mom or dad had an Omega, then they might consider an Omega. If dad had a tag, they might consider that one or some other watch they knew that somebody once owned. This is your slightly over-exaggerated but generic stereotypical upper mid-range watch consumer. Before you jump to conclusions, I'm not implying that these customers don't have standards. They very much do and they're actually quite high despite the fact that it's not about Metes and Kosk and Nevochrome and Parachrome and mainspring barrels. That's not the stuff they care about. I'm fairly certain that they know less about watches than your typical first time Christopher Ward fears or Formex buyer. The brands in this space are not dependent on enthusiasts to make their money. Unsurprisingly, this is also why branding and marketing is so important in this space. The first exposure to these brands is going to be as a sponsor of the Olympics or Wimbledon or some famous actor. You're going to see the ad for this brand in a fashion magazine or a business magazine or in the departure lounge of the airport. At the AD or in the department store, these are the watches that have their own boutiques and cordoned off areas to signal that these watches are relatively speaking more exclusive. Whatever story the brand tells in those situations might just be the defining moments for how the brand is perceived. Often, a key to bringing customers in is not just about how good the watch is, but how the customer identifies with the brand. Glashütte is proud to be the original. Guess what? They want customers that see themselves as original. They might as well be saying, for people that don't want that Rolex that everybody else wants. Omega? They link their watches to stars and whatever the stars stand for. George Clooney, Daniel Craig, way back it was Cindy Crawford. To this day, they bank on star power to drive sales. 
Cartier is all about art, refinement, style, not fashion. And it's almost regal in some ways. And Rolex? Rolex is more often than not just Rolex and the crown. Because the crown is king. It's status. It's achievement. It's the pinnacle. All brands do this at all price points, but the marketing Christopher Ward, Monta, and Formex do is not as focused on identity differentiation as it is in this upper mid space. Having a clear brand identity and positioning is just ridiculously important when you want people to pay $10,000 for a lump of steel that ticks. You might think, yeah, it's not that important, but I think Grand Seiko versus Rolex is a brilliant example of how important this branding piece is. If you want to set the watch nerds off, then ask them the question, is Grand Seiko better than Rolex? What you're in for is a day-long discussion about Grand Seiko, Zeratsu polishing, hyper-precise movements, intricate dials, and of course, subpar bracelets. My own opinion, Grand Seiko are exceptional watches, but how many people outside of Japan identify with the concept of beautifully precise Japanese watchmaking. Grand Seiko, from a marketing perspective, is sterile. It maybe appeals to the engineer segment, but for the upper middle class Joe blogs, I would argue that Grand Seiko evokes zero emotion. Rolex does. These days, it's a little bit more negative emotions when it comes to Rolex, but it's still love or hate where Grand Seiko is at best, from a marketing perspective, a huge meh. That's not going to get customers that aren't enthusiasts through the door. The second element that customers expect is that the watch communicates those brand perceptions in their design and the quality. Specifically, it revolves around a term called perceived quality. Two examples. It's the sound a car door makes when it closes, specifically an Audi or a Mercedes or a BMW. Pretty much all car doors close the way they're supposed to, but a quality door has a signature thunk to it. You know it when you hear it and you associate it with being a quality door and a quality car. Second example in cars again, it's the feel of the materials in a car. Some dashboard plastics feel very plasticky, where others feel more solid, less brittle, more supple. In both situations, they're both plastic, but something about the texture and the sound and the touch communicates a higher quality. Now in a watch, perceived quality can be manipulated in a couple of ways. It's polish. Cartier, Rolex, Glass, Hooter, Hublot, it doesn't matter. Shiny reflective surfaces attract crows and they communicate refinement and quality. This applies to cases, dials, and bracelets. Case in point, which watch communicates higher price? The matte steel Oyster Bracelet Submariner or the polished Centrelink GMT? Compared to a Datejust, how much luxury does the Grand Seiko White Birch communicate? The Datejust looks more luxury by a mile. The fluted bezel, the sunburst dial, and the polished center links just communicate premium far more than a restrained birch dial and a restrained Zeratsu polish. It's irrelevant which one may be objectively better or technically more competent. The Rolex just looks like better quality. It's also about texture, depth, and detail. Grand Seiko has textured dials. Glass Hütter has applied white gold markers. The Omega Seamaster has a wavy dial. The Zenith Pilot has a dial that has dial textures of a World War II era Junkers, I think. Flat dials communicate less quality compared to dials with stuff applied to them. It's also certifications and guarantees. Being able to state that you have a certain accuracy preferably externally verified, is something buyers lean on. It's almost irrelevant what the actual certification actually does, but a formal seal of approval has a value to the high-end customer. It's also premium materials. The bezel on a Datejust is white gold, a Zenith is carbon ceramic. A ceramic bezel is more premium because it's shiny and reflective where aluminum isn't. And yes, there are advantages, practical advantages to ceramic over aluminum, but that's not why the ceramic is there. The ceramic is there because it looks like better quality. It's also weight or heft. Light things feel cheap. My dad was a hi-fi and speaker engineer and he would always joke that if you want people to believe a speaker is high quality, he said, just throw one or two bricks into the base. When people try to move it, they'll perceive it as better quality, even though the sound is terrible. He also said, People think headphones that have a lot of bass are high quality. 
low tones convey quality more than the detail of high notes. But for him, the true signifier of quality was clarity and separation, not weight and bass. My dad wasn't wrong. A white gold Submariner or a Day-Date weighs more, feels heavier than a Datejust or a regular Submariner. It's also feel. It's how the movement winds, it's how the clasp opens, it's how the bracelet rattles or doesn't. I had a Monta in hand a while ago and the bracelet is amazing. It's a supremely well-made and comfortable bracelet, but the opening mechanism was too tight. It was just by a tiny margin. It was solid, but compared to a Rolex, the Rolex managed to convey two things, that it was secure and that it was easy to open. The Monta was only secure. Who does this well and who doesn't? Rolex, of course. Ask anyone that knows anything about watches and they will say Rolex is a success watch. They won't know who Hans Wilsdorf was, but they'll know Rolex has been around for ages and ask them if they know anything about their watches. They are bound to mention that watch with this shiny reflective bezel. Cartier is also really good at this. If someone has a lock on luxury women's watches, I would guess that it was Cartier. But for men too, Cartier has its appeal. Omega, on the other hand, are good, but not great, because they're mainly let down by leaning on movie stars in a time where leading men and leading women don't sell tickets in the same ways that they did in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. If there's anybody that doesn't do well, I bring up Grand Seiko again, because it's not just their branding. If you look at something like the Grand Seiko Schönbrunn, you know the one, it's the pink cherry blossom dial with the titanium case. It's an excellent watch for a lot of people. It has Zeratsu polishing here and there, uh, but you know that. It's got titanium, but that feels cheap to a first time watch buyer because it's light. There's also no super shiny reflective bezel. The dial itself, which I've said in another video, is a little bit too restrained. A lot of Grand Seiko watches like the Shunbun aren't showy enough. That super subdued Japanese Seiko style just doesn't communicate the luxury that speaks to a lot of Western audiences. All in all, most brands in this space from Tag to Rolex, with a few exceptions like Grand Seiko, have watches that do a relatively decent job of conveying luxury and premium quality. There's a brand that I think exemplifies the risk of this space really, really well, and it's Hublot. If you boil down those two components of identity or brand on the one hand, and then perceived quality on the other, you'll see that in a Hublot, you get exactly that. You get a brand that has a strong identity about footballers and success and richness and youth, and then you've got perceived quality in terms of shiny watches that look expensive. But Hublot is hated on, and part of it is because of Jean-Claude Beaver's historical brash, over-the-top, in-your-face marketing. But the biggest problem is that the perceived quality and the actual quality don't match, not always at least. The entry-level Hublot Classic Fusions cost somewhere around eight, nine thousand dollars by now, and you get them on a rubber strap, and you get them with a Salita movement, which is functionally identical to the movement you'll find in a $1,000 Christopher Ward. But Hublot succeeds with their brand identity and their perceived quality in convincing regular watch buyers that despite objective quality weaknesses, they are worth buying. For me though, it doesn't stop at Hublot because other brands are guilty of this as well. Cartier still makes watches with relatively cheaper quartz movements in some of their aspirational models like the large size Santos Dumont. Cartier does this in part because they have a lot of female customers and female customers, at least from a marketing perspective, are perceived to not really care about mechanical movements, so why bother putting them in there? But even in male models, they put in quartz movements and when they even have some movements that are relatively good, it's never really a big component of their marketing. You can also see it in something like the latest Cartier Santos Dual Time, which has a Salita movement inside. A lot of other brands to this day still label sourced movements as in-house to manipulate the perceived quality of the watch. As a consumer, I would argue that there is a risk of being hoodwinked here, which is greater than a lot of other places. 
whether you get a San Martin or a Pagani, for the price, you are pretty much getting what you're paying for. The same goes for Formex or Baltic or Christopher Ward. Watches in those price ranges are hyper similar because a lot of the parts come from the same sub vendors, the competition is massive, and the budget for tons of branding isn't there. So the money has to go into the product, and the products largely tend to be of a very similar quality. When you go all the way up to Patek and Moser and Vacheron level, you're generally not getting cheated either. A lot of those watches are overpriced for the actual amount of man hours that go into making them. And the amount of money you are throwing at their marketing budget is huge, but the watches aren't bad in terms of objective quality. The reason is simple. When you're selling a watch for $600,000 or $400,000, the amount of money you need to spend on just making it a solid watch that won't break or has a decent component inside is not worth saving in the grander scheme of things. It doesn't make up a huge proportion of the overall cost of the watch. But in this upper mid space, the risk is bigger. Differentiation also means that it doesn't get easier because when you have to have a clear and ideally differentiated identity and people are largely swayed by quality and not any sort of objective quality measures, then you don't necessarily have to compete on specs. Down in the Christopher Ward space, almost all watches have around about 50 or 60 hours of power reserve. Almost all watches will have comparable bracelets. The adoption of things like easy adjust and quick switch bracelets is slowly making its way into all brands in that space. It's not to the same extent the case in the upper mid space. Take, for example, a Submariner, 70 hours of power reserve, a Seamaster 300M, 55, a CQ has 40, and an IWC Pilot has 120 hours. It's all over the place. An IWC Pilot has a quick release, an easy switch bracelet, uh, an Oyster Perpetual doesn't. Uh, a Zenith might as well have a stamped clasp, which is comparable with a Seiko SKX. Hublot, again, like I said before, has a Salita movement. Omega has all their watches, Metas certified or approved, and Cartier sometimes uses really, really good Piaget movements, but they don't even bother to brand them or use it as a selling point. Whether it's movements, materials, or bracelets, or even the box you get your watch in, these things can be all over the place. So comparing them like for like is often really not feasible. Which brings me to Rolex. Rolex dominates in this space. They make up one third of all Swiss watches sold in terms of value. They dominate because of their identity. Rolex very simply communicates, we're the best. They choose to brand themselves with people like Roger Federer, one of the world's best tennis players. They don't bother with actors because actors can't, to the same extent as a sports person, be judged as objectively good. You can like an actor and they can be good, but there's still a subjective component. A tennis player, he has titles or she has titles. They have objective measurements for being the best. Second, it's down to perceived and actual quality. The fluted bezel on a Datejust is the ultimate shiny chrome magnet. The ceramic of a GMT or a Submariner bezel screams luxury more than any aluminum bezel can. The gold crown on a dial reflects light in a way that steel just doesn't. Their watches, they have heft. And above all else, there is no category where Rolex falls flat on actual quality. Potentially a Metas movement from Omega is technically better, but the Rolex movement is really, really good. The same goes for bracelets, easy adjust mechanisms, dials. A lot of other brands have, at least in some of their models, weaknesses. Zenith has weak bracelets. Gigi Le Cult has weak water resistance in some models. Rolex just doesn't. Then there's the last thing. Rolex has been around for a very long time. That pure shape of the Oyster case, whether it's the Perpetual or the Daytona or the 1908, is by now associated with luxury and quality. It's got a shine and a suppleness and a case shape that millions of people associate with luxury and quality in a watch. Every other brand is playing catch up with that perception. Are you getting ripped off in general? So far, I've argued that a lot in this space is about brand identity and perceived quality. And like I said, it is a recipe for being hoodwinked. But there's a good thing about this market, about this space, and that's that it's transparent. 
Word of mouth is important. Consistent bad customer experiences get around. It's also hyper competitive. The brands end up having to keep each other in check. Omega very actively chose Metas as a way to challenge Rolex in terms of quality. When IWC launches a movement that has 120 hours of power reserve, that is to differentiate themselves. Hublot does so too, maybe not in the Salita entry classic fusions, but in the higher end they would work with ceramics, some of it's sourced, but at the end of the day they are also trying to do some things that are not only perceived quality, but are also recognized to some extent as actual quality. The overall level of competition in this space is massive. Brands do need to stay on their toes, both in terms of marketing, in terms of understanding what customers want in terms of design, and also in terms of actual quality and features. Competition is, for the most part, keeping these brands relatively honest. Compared to the lower end, these watches will generally tend to be better. We can't pretend that we are only paying for marketing. A Rolex is objectively better in most ways to a Formex. The finishing is just that little bit better. The precision is just that little bit better. The materials are that little bit more exclusive. But you are paying for Roger Federer. You are paying for Wimbledon and you are paying for Red Bull Formula One racing and Alinghi racing and all that other stuff. You are also paying for an AD network that adds close to 50% on top of the wholesale price. I think I've said this in pretty much every second or third video I've done. Above four, five, six ish thousand dollars, the for each dollar increase in actual watch quality, the sales price increases disproportionately more to recoup those marketing costs, the distribution costs, and also just to make a higher profit per watch. That's the reality. Let's put all that together. You are watching this video and you're still here, thank you. It's appreciated, but the key question you might still be asking is, the way you explain it, Mike, it sounds like I can't find a way to choose a good watch in this price range. In this space, marketing and branding is important and it is a smokescreen, but concluding that it's all marketing would be incorrect. Inevitably, there's going to be somebody in the comments that says, Rolex is for idiots, it's all marketing and we're all sheep. I completely understand the distaste for Rolex these days, but the comment would be a little bit on the simplistic side because it's not just about marketing, not just for Rolex, but for all of them. All the brands market. A Hublot watch is not complete junk and a Rolex is not pure marketing. As a new buyer, it is incredibly hard to judge what you're getting for your money. Enthusiasts, are going to have stronger, clearer, and more well-informed opinions and are going to be less affected by brand building efforts. But we are also affected by the way we identify with these brands. But whether or not you are an enthusiast or you are a first-time buyer, I would always say in this space, in general, of course, but definitely in this space, pay attention, do your due diligence, and consider if you're buying the watch for the branding and the identity or whether you personally actually like it. As always, make up your own mind. Use your head. You ask questions, you Google. This is the price range where you really have to put in the work. And don't listen to the crazies and just buy what you like. Which are the best brands in the space and why? Let me know in the comments. Like, subscribe. Cheers.